Chapter Fourteen of Billy Bradley at Treasure Cove by Janet D. Wheeler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Crabs to the Crab. The crowd from the stands rushed down upon the field, calling Chet Bradley's name. They raised him on their shoulders, forming a solid snake dance procession. It was some minutes before he was able to escape from his admirers and join his comrades beneath the showers and such a celebration as they afterward had in the gymnasium. Chet was, of course, the chief hero of the occasion, though Teddy, on the strength of that run in the first half of the night, was a close second. Poor Ferd Stowing had spent his time on the substitute's bench, but there was no hint of jealousy in the credit he gave the chums for their excellent performance on the diamond. All the girls are trying to rush our boys, Laura complained, between dances, when Chet and Teddy and Ferd had gone off to fetch glasses of fruit punch. If they don't get them away from us, it won't be their fault. Even then, I don't think we'd be neglected, giggled Billy, as a group of four or five boys bore down toward their corner. That's one good thing about affairs here at Boxton, Vi agreed. There are always so many more boys than girls that we never need be afraid we will have to sit out dances. They had a glorious time the rest of that afternoon so glorious, in fact, that the girls could hardly tear themselves away when it became necessary to paddle back to Three Towers Hall, and how the boys hated to have them go. It was a wonderful game and a wonderful party, Billy told Teddy Jordan, as the two lingered behind the others on their way back to the boat landing. I never had a better time in my life. There will be more when we get back to school in the fall, said Teddy. By the way, he added, Try to get a look at that map of Treasure Cove, will you, Billy? And if you could arrange a meeting between us fellows and Ben Halcombe in the next two or three days, we'd appreciate it. Might be a good idea to meet the old chap, sort of size him up and talk to him a little more about the treasure ship Marlin. Think you could arrange it? Sure, I can, replied Billy. I'll let you know when. So it came to pass that two days later a small group of young folks gathered about Ben Halcombe in the woods near Three Towers Hall and listened to his words as though he were an oracle. "'Do you really think that mutineer fellow was telling the truth?' Ferd Stowing asked. "'He never lied with his dying breath,' Ben protested. "'There wouldn't have been sense in that. But there's no use talking about it,' he added, in a discouraged voice. "'I ain't got the money to make a search.' Suppose we should put up money to make the search, Billy said softly. A flame leaped into the blue eyes of the old sailor. He studied the ring of intent young faces for a moment in silence. Then he asked, You really mean that? No fooling? We really mean it. No fooling, answered Billy solemnly. Ben Halcombe stretched out a sunburned hand. Reckon we'll shake on that, he said, seeing as we're partners from this time on. And once the fortune's found, he lowered his voice and looked about him cautiously. Once we've dug up the Marlin's treasure, we'll split an even fifty-fifty. He got to his feet slowly with the aid of the cane he was still forced to carry. He reached in his pocket and extracted an old-fashioned wallet. From this, with the greatest care, he drew a piece of crumpled paper. He handed this solemnly to Billy Bradley. It's the map he said. You can make a copy of it, and then give the original back to me. He stood now for a moment, regarding the young people as they bent absorbedly over the crumpled bit of paper. Then his rugged old face suddenly broke into a myriad quizzical wrinkles. Avast, me hearties, avast, he cried, and raised an imaginary tankard on high, as though about to drink their health. Here's to us, adventurers all. May we live hardy and die hard. And here, extending his sunburned hand to them once more, is my hand upon it. Having made this fascinating compact with Ben Halcombe, the boys and girls could scarcely wait to leave their respective schools and return to North Bend. Even the two big dances, one at Boxton Academy and the other at Three Towers Hall, to which generally they all looked forward eagerly during the entire school year, paled into insignificance beside the proposed treasure hunt. The girls copied the map and stowed this copy away safely among their belongings, returning the original to the old sailor. The latter, now almost completely recovered from his accident, 
left Three Towers the day before commencement, expressing the hope that he would see the girls and boys again before long. He will, ejaculated Billy. If there is any delay, it will be the fault of our families, not ours, added Vi. The closing festivities were over at last, and there came the day when Billy and Vi and Laura stood on the station platform at Mulata, waiting for the train that would bear them back to North Bend and their parents. There were others on the platform, too. In fact, the station was crowded with groups of boys and girls, all excited and elated at the prospect of being released from school. Teddy Jordan and Chet Bradley were there, and Ferd Stowing. The three immediately took in tow the North Bend girls' luggage as well as their own. Suddenly Vi exclaimed, Here comes Amanda Peabody. Laura giggled. She is going to pass close to us so that she can give us the cut direct. Watch. Amanda swept by, closely followed by her shadow. The former's nose was in the air. She looked directly at Billy and her chums, and then passed them by without a sign of recognition. Didn't I tell you? cried Laura. But Billy uttered an exclamation of horror. Chet, she cried, what did you do? Nothing, returned Chet, trying to look innocent. You did, too. I saw you drop something into Amanda's handbag as she went by. Only it wasn't much, Chet argued. Only a crab. A crab, cried Laura and Vi, as horrified as Billy had been a moment before. You don't mean to say, added Laura, that you put a live crab into Amanda's handbag. Dead crab would be worse, Chet argued. At the moment there came a wild scream from farther down the platform. The three girls craned their necks and saw Amanda running toward them, with something suspended from one uplifted, wildly waving hand. A crab, she screamed. A live crab. Someone get it off, quick. Ow! Several boys and girls ran to her assistance, while the ripple of laughter among the young folks on the station platform rose to a merry shout. Before Billy could see whether Amanda had been released from her unfortunate predicament, the train came rumbling into the station. That was a mean trick, she told her brother, as the latter reached for the luggage. It's no fun to have a crab bite you. Crabs don't bite, they pinch, amended Chet. Anyway, it's all right. Sweets to the sweet, you know, and crabs to the crab. In spite of herself, Billy giggled as she climbed aboard the train. The ride back to North Bend seemed unusually short and pleasant. Upon their arrival there, the girls and boys found their parents waiting for them. On all sides were the joyful greetings of families reunited. See you tomorrow, Billy called to her friends as she and Chet started off toward home, escorted by their father and mother. We'll want to talk over. Well, you know what? They did, and they were surprised, these eager would-be adventurers, to find out how much talking over with their parents was necessary before consent was given to their exciting plans. I've heard about this place you speak of, said Mr. Bradley. He was beginning to weaken. Both Billy and Chet knew the signs. Treasure Cove, Dad, Chet prompted. Ahem, yes, admitted Mr. Bradley. It's a simple, old-fashioned summer resort, I believe, where people go from one year to the other. It has a, a reputation. What sort, Dad? Billy sat on the arm of her father's chair and ruffled up his hair. Her tone was coaxing. Billy's mother pretended to be sewing but all the time she was watching her husband and children with an understanding eye. If anyone had been watching her closely, it might have seemed that she was laughing to herself. I believe, continued Mr. Bradley, clearing his throat again, that there is an odd romantic story about the place. People say that pirates used to land there in the old days. That's where it got its name of Treasure Cove. Then if you know the place, you won't mind letting us go there, will you, Dad? Billy coaxed, would be perfectly safe, especially if we take the boys along. Mrs. Bradley looked up from her sewing. The gleam in her eyes was more noticeable now. Let them go, Martin, she said in her sweet, soft voice. Remember the time when you were young? It wasn't so long ago, really. And be merciful. Mother, cried Billy, jumping up. Do you mean that we may go? If your father says so, returned Mrs. Bradley. Martin Bradley lifted his shoulders in a gesture of defeat and laughed. 
What chance have I got with three against me? Go and dig up your treasure, you two. Jove, with a sigh, I wish I were going with you. End of chapter 14